Hello and welcome. My name is Ambika Sahai. I am the founder and executive director of Art Forum SF. Art Forum is a not-for-profit here in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, that works to promote the South Asian voice in today's world. I would also like to say that today we stand in solidarity for the Asian American community. We do not uh, support the violence that's been happening here in the US. Now, I would like to talk to you about uh, the programs that we've been doing. We've produced the South Asian Literature and Art Festival uh, to a great success, but times have changed. And now we have moved to doing this uh, virtually. In today's episode, we tackle the question, do Desis yearn to be ruled by strong men? This episode promises to be a lively conversation about celebrity, society, and cult of masculinity in contemporary South Asia with a deeper look into Pakistan's situation. We bring to you today's guest, uh, Moni Mohsin. She'll be talking about the emerging uh, women in, in Pakistan today. Her book has been a great refuge to me, reading all her books, and uh, especially during these lockdown days. Her style of writing is really unique and very insightful. To bring out most of her um, protagonist, Social Butterfly and Ruby R, we have a charming young woman, Hamna Zubair. Welcome, Hamna. Hi, Ambika. How are you? Good. Let me introduce you to Hamna, our host. She is a writer, editor, and cultural critic living in Karachi, Pakistan. She was previously cultural editor at Dawn.com, uh, Pakistan's largest English language daily newspaper. She has an MFA in creative writing uh, from New York City. And um, now she is doing journalism work in Pakistan. Her work on feminism, the art, and how the two intersect in South Asia have appeared in Vogue, Slate, The Herald, Dawn and various other publications. Before I hand over the space to Hamna, I'd like to request you to please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please do like and share our videos. And please do invite other, your friends to uh, join Virtual Sala live series. So now without further ado, I invite Hamna to begin our program. And uh, I am signing off. Take care. Thank you, Ambika. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our session today. Uh, Ambika just introduced me, so I won't do that over again. But what I will do is introduce the guest that I will be talking to, who is Moni Mohsen. Um, and Moni Mohsen, if you don't already know, is a British Pakistani author and journalist who has been most famous for her novel, uh, Diary of a Social Butterfly. Um, and But that's not all that she's written. She's actually the author of many books besides. Um, her books include The End of Innocence, Tender Hooks, The Return of the Butterfly, and most recently, The Impeccable Integrity of Ruby R, which is actually why we're here, because this book has just come out, uh, has just been published, and we're definitely going to be talking more about it as we move on. Um, and I think this is a good time for us to bring Moni into the conversation. Um, and get her to talk about the book. And uh, before before we bring Moni in, I'll just say that I have obviously read The Impeccable Integrity of Ruby R, and I found it very fascinating. I very much enjoyed the read. And rather than myself giving you um, uh, an overview of the book, I thought I would ask Moni to say a few words about the book, maybe give us a brief overview, and then we can take it from there. Moni, would you like to say something about your most recent book that's just been published? Hi, Hamna. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words. Um, I'm delighted to be here today. Um, so <clears throat> uh, the impeccable integrity of Ruby R is about a young woman called Ruby Rauf, who is a scholarship student. And she has, after a lot of uh, effort and hard work um, and dedication, she has finally won a scholarship to come to England to study um, business and media 
and um, she uh, attends while she, so Ruby um, is a very determined young woman, a very idealistic young woman. And uh, she has her um, eyes and her mind set on doing well at, at university and then uh, getting a job in Pakistan um, on her return, uh, which will allow her to become independent and will allow her to um, become prosperous. While she's um, at this um, college studying, one day she goes to a lecture um, where she uh, hears um, a charismatic leader speak. He's a Pakistani gentleman and he used to be a reality TV star and a film star and now wants to enter politics. And she is so um, taken by him that when he offers her a job as his social media organizer, um, she drops her uh, degree midway and she goes to Pakistan and she does that. And um, when she's there, she realizes very soon that um, politics is not as easy as she thought it was. Um, and she is um, um, confronted by a whole array of, uh, of um, conflicts um, which test her ideals and which test her principles. Great, thank you for that introduction, Moni. Um, and yes, like I said, I have read the book and uh, that was a wonderful synopsis, which kind of gives us an overview of the book. Um, and I wanted to dive a little bit deeper so that people kind of understand uh, the setting of this book. And um, I will say that when I read uh, The Impeccable in Integrity of Ruby Ralph, um, a few things stood out to me. Right. Uh, there is a main character who, like you said, is this charismatic leader who used to be a reality TV star uh, and now he's entered politics. And his buzzword is that he wants to create a corruption free Pakistan. He's very idealistic. He talks a big talk. Um, you know, he's putting together a political party from scratch, trying to get young blood into the party. Um, and, you know, immediately my thoughts went to the current uh, government in Pakistan. And I thought, well, this this character and this political party has so many strong parallels between it and uh, the present ruling party, uh, Terry Kane's Pakistan, Terry Kane South, and its leader, Imran Khan. Um, so I'm wondering, um, and you know, I don't like to talk too much about direct influences or direct inspirations because um, I know that there's so much that influences a writer when they sit down to write a book, right? But I do want to ask, are you expecting many people to draw that same parallel between these two characters, Saif Haq, your main character, and Imran Khan, that I'm drawing right now? Like, is that something you expect? And also, where were you mentally when you were writing this book? What were what was influencing you at the time, not just as a writer, but um, you know, as a person? What what was around you? What was the time that you were writing this book? And I think that would be really interesting to give us a deeper insight. So. Um... The germ of this book came to me around 2016, I think, uh, with the uh, election of Donald Trump, then Brexit, and uh, then shortly after that, uh, uh, Imran Khan's election, then after that, uh, Modi's re-election. Um, and there seemed to be a kind of wave of populism sort of um, sweeping across the globe. And it's not just these guys, there was also, um, you know, in Hungary, it was happening in other parts of the world as well, I think in, in Brazil, etc. cetera. Um, so <clears throat> I began thinking about this. And at the same time, there was Harvey Weinstein, there was the Me Too movement. Mm -hmm. There was that, if you remember, soon after Donald Trump was inaugurated, there was this uh, massive uh, uh, protest march from women, one million yes. women on the streets of, of um, in, in, in a protest of, of, of his um, misogynistic comments. Mm -hmm. um, if you remember, you know, there were those kitty um, mm -hmm. um, hats, which were uh, a direct allusion to his, his very mm -hmm. uh, abrasive and uh, abusive comments about women. Mm -hmm. um, and um, in Britain also, um, you know, and, and everybody, all these populist leaders had their little slogans, you know, like, um, make America great again, or drain the swamp, or take back control in Britain, or corruption free society in um, uh, Pakistan, 
और अच्छे दिन आएंगे इन इन इंडिया सो ऑल ऑफ दिस वाज काइंड ऑफ प्लेइंग ऑन माय माइंड एंड आई वाज थिंकिंग अबाउट दिस एंड आई थॉट दैट आई वुड लाइक टू डू सेट दिस कैरेक्टर इन पाकिस्तान यू नो टॉक अबाउट पॉपुलिज्म इन पाकिस्तान एंड आई डिडंट वांट टू write about any one particular person because i think that's very limiting and as you know writers take their influences from a lot of different places and i wanted mm-hmm. to make it a, a character who i also wanted to talk about the cult of celebrity because i think you know donald trump was a, a was a celebrity people in america recognized his name and he had um they they thought in a weird kind of way you know people make that kind of leap they think that if they watch somebody in reality television they know mm-hmm. that that they they somehow know that person personally you know um, yeah. and so i wanted that and and because reality uh, uh, television is so big now in the world i wanted to talk about that i wanted to talk about social media i wanted to talk about um, abuse and trolling i wanted to talk about patriarchy i wanted to talk also i wanted to explore the cult of celebrity and when mm-hmm. i was playing the character of sir park i wanted to have a kind of 24 character celebrity if you know what i mean right. so i was going to a kind of background of um a film star uh, a very famous film star and i have to say i i borrowed uh, quite a lot from amita bachchan you know who was a great mm-hmm. film star and a hero when i was growing up um and 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 you know a hero who wasn't just a hero on on screen people actually thought he was like that and and when he had that accident they all went to sort of pray for him and and i remember people getting uh, very upset about that um and so it's a mix you know it's a little bit of this a little bit of that um but all of these thoughts were going through my head at that time also the reaction you know the pushback from women from mm-hmm. liberal, from a black lives matter all of that was sort of interesting to me Yeah and uh, one thing that is interesting about this book which uh, uh is a bit different um it struck me in your uh, previous books like your uh, diary of a social butterfly tender hooks uh where looking at society we you know with your books we always kind of look at society society through the lens of a woman mm-hmm. and um but right now we're looking at it through the lens of a young woman who is quite a lot bit younger than uh, a lot of your other characters main characters in your other books she is just uh, about to graduate from college she is uh, you know about to start her professional life very much still a student when we meet her um and it's interesting because as we know in pakistan we have a, a young population we have a population that skews incredibly young um and this population is uh a big segment that was very enamored mm. by the new political party which emerged um you know and and well which was elected to power just now um so what i want to know is how different was that for you how was that shift from talking about looking through the eyes of someone who um was a bit older um uh you know we would call them a socialite your previous characters right uh, and moving it through and looking at the world now through the eyes of this idealistic optimistic really young college student and um and how was that and when young people will read this book what do you think their reaction would be and do you hope for any specific reaction for them or are you just completely like uh, open to whatever actually i must correct you hamna my very first book was um the end of innocence which was narrated by a, a nine year old girl so the um, ah yes <laughs> so the, that first uh, protagonist was actually the youngest protagonist i've had yeah. in my in my work um but yes uh, ruby is is younger than the butterfly um yeah. and ruby is uh, much more ambitious and ruby is is trying to make her place in the world mm-hmm. uh, but trying to find her own voice trying to establish herself trying to understand who she represents and what uh, what is important to her um and uh, the butterfly has sort of figured those things out for herself already um with regard to how young people will read this book uh, i hope they will read it with an open mind you know i would that's the only thing i can't say to people like my work or don't like my work i would like to uh, i would like them to engage with it seriously and i would like them to think 
to explore the ideas that I'm putting forward to, with an open mind. I find something which really depresses me these days is that, um, you know, I was watching this uh, um, uh, interview of, of Meghan Markle, and mm -hmm. even before you've actually seen the interview, they're already Team Markle and Team mm -hmm. uh, um, Royal Family or whatever British fam uh, Royal Family, and. Right. Uh, you uh, even before you watched the interview, you've already made up your mind uh, whose side you're on. And right. if you say that, you know, I felt that she was a little bit naive, they'll say, so that means you are uh, racist. That means you are, are pro Brexit. That means mm -hmm. you probably are, uh, uh, you know, make America great. You're probably a Trump supporter. It's mm -hmm. not that at all. I think that, you know, um, um, one should be allowed to think. To, to see, to, to weigh up uh, what, what you have in front of you, rather than adopt these kind of uh, very um, definite positions without right. actually looking at something, you know, looking at the material that you're presented with. Yeah, and uh, what struck me actually about uh, the character and also about your novel is you talk so much about social media in the novel. Um, and uh, your protagonist, Ruby R, is actually hired by this political party to manage their social media, right? And uh, social media, I think, I mean, it's not even my opinion. There have been countless articles and studies on this. Uh, our culture of instant gratification, um, of not wanting to publicly be acknowledged that you're wrong, right? It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a space where your ego is on the line. It kind of forces you into these hard line positions. Uh, which you might not even adopt in your daily conversations, which are free flowing. There's a lot of give and take, but there's not that kind of give and take on social media. And, you know, uh, you're active on social media, you know, you're active on Twitter, you're active on Instagram. Um, and I do, I wonder, like, uh, and this is one of my questions for you. And as we move through this, we'll, uh, you know, move forward to some more questions about social media. But how through the lens of social media, having now been online, how have you seen the reactions to your work and your work itself evolve all the way from the beginning of your career to now? Um, and, you know, because social media is now such a big part of this book of yours. So if you could give me some insight onto how that has kind of influenced uh, your perspective, like you just mentioned, and also your very real work as a writer. Um, so do you have any insight on that? So, um Hamna, actually, I look upon social media as um, um, just the frosting on the cake, really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, there's your work, and then social media is something that publicizes your work. Mm -hmm. It's not your work itself. Mm -hmm. you know, social media cannot become your work. It is, um, it, 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 for me, certainly, it amplifies what I have done. Um, and I have, um, you know, 30 years of, of of um, um, writing behind me. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that there are a lot of people who are social media stars and they become um, big voices through social media, etc. But for me, that is not the case. For me, mm -hmm. I look for it only as a way of amplifying my other work. Um, I see also that in social media, the reason why I wanted to write about um, uh, this, this phenomenon was also because I find that um, you know, The Guardian ran a um, uh, research uh, mm -hmm. on um, who gets abused most uh, yes. and told most uh, amongst their various uh, contributors and their mm -hmm. writers. And they discovered that by far it was women who got the, the abuse. And among women, it was women of color who got it the mm -hmm. most. Um, and in Pakistan as well, I see, you know, constantly um, uh, it's, the abuse is also not just uh, um, not just a disagreement with you or uh, a, a difference of opinion. It is mm -hmm. actually uh, physical abuse and threats and intimidation yeah. and threats of sexual violence, uh, which I think is very um, ugly. Uh, and I wanted mm -hmm. to talk about that. And I wanted to. Uh, uh, confront that in my book and talk about mm -hmm. how it affects young women. Yeah, and you know, and I think that ugly side of misogyny 
is uh, more evident today thanks to uh, the fact that it is actually you know in front of us all on social media but of course it always existed and uh, what I do want to touch upon is the evolution of your work and especially going back to uh, your columns that became a novel, uh, Diary of a Social Butterfly. Um, and what's interesting to me is that it started out as a newspaper column. Uh, and I think when we had a, a discussion a few days ago, you mentioned how uh, even though that was before the time of social media, the response, because it was a newspaper column, the response that you used to get to that was pretty immediate. You know, you would you'd publish a column in the Friday Times and the next day you would get a response and people would be calling you or writing to you. So in a way, you have been familiar with that instant kind of reaction to your work or, or uh, you know, uh, that response that you get uh, very quickly. And um, I wanted to talk about that a little bit, your experience with that, how that prepped you kind of for the social media era, if it did at all, um, and how that actually became a book. And, um, and then I'll, I'll, ask, I'll ask you a few further questions on that. So I'm not the difference between the kind of response I used to get to the Diary of Social Butterfly um, after I'd published the column and then I'd go out and people would, you know, if I, if I was in a, in a public gathering, somebody would come up and say something to me about it. Um, the difference is that, you know, when somebody comes up to you and, and makes a comment about your work, they're not anonymous, right? They're in front of yeah. you. You know mm -hmm. who they are. On social media, people are anonymous. So mm -hmm. that anonymity gives them uh, a kind of cover, if you know what I mean. And therefore, they feel more emboldened to say the kind of things or make the kind of critiques they wouldn't otherwise. Mm -hmm. Having said that, um, uh, well, they wouldn't have the courage to do. So having said yeah. that, um, I must say that I've been extraordinarily lucky so far. And people have been very generous to me with the, uh, with the Diary of a Social Butterfly. I have been... Um, um, I have had readers from the start and they have stayed the course and I've also acquired younger readers over the years. Um, so how did that become a book? Um, I, my first novel was uh, The End of Innocence, which was set in 1971 and it was about a young girl growing up in a village. Um, the, <clears throat> the Diary of a Social Butterfly actually predated that. Um, I. Um, started writing the diary of a social butterfly in the 1990s it seemed like forever mm -hmm. now but yeah i uh, and then um the end of innocence came out in 2006 i was invited to the um jaipur literary festival um where i was uh, reading from my book and on you know uh, taking part in a panel on pakistani writing with kamala shamsi there um while I was there, I was approached by a uh, Indian publisher and asked if I would like to compile the columns into a book um, because the, the column was also um, uh, reproduced in an Indian newspaper. So Indian readers were familiar with it. And um, so she said, you know, why don't you uh, uh, put that together for me and edit the columns and send it to me? And I said, no, why would anybody want to read that? Because it's already been published with mm -hmm. the why would anybody want to reread it? So she said, no, 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 when you have a book, it becomes something different. And when something is you know, presented together, mm -hmm. there is an arc and you write a, an introduction, write a conclusion and send it to me. Um, I was at that time working on a novel which wasn't going very well. So I thought, okay, I'll just try this. So I, I then um, wrote it up, I, I compiled the columns, I wrote an introduction, I wrote a um, conclusion sort of uh, afterward. And um, I sent it off to five uh, publishers in India and three wrote back immediately and said that they would like it. Um, and eventually uh, I went with um, Chiki Sarkar who was running Random House India at the moment, uh, at, at that time. And uh, she um, uh, was very, uh, very um, enthusiastic about the book and she published it very well with a lot of fanfare. And it went on to do very well in India. And then after that, she asked me to write a uh, novel with the same characters. And that's how Tender Hooks came to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And she um, said, and at the time, actually, when she, when she read my work for the first time, she didn't know me. She had never read The Butterfly. I just sent it to her because somebody said to me she's a savvy uh, publisher and, and send it to her. Um, so when I sent it to her, she said, um, I had always thought this book would come out of India. I'm very surprised that it's come out of Pakistan. 
Interesting. Um, and my question, actually, uh, my comment when you told me the story just now was that um, I can see why a publisher would be interested in this book, uh, Diary of a Social Butterfly, and then it's, you know, follow ups, because it lifts the lid on a segment of Pakistani society, which is quite, um, quite secretive. And they, um, the segment of Pakistani society, which whether you want to call them the elites, the financial elite, the social elite, uh, you know, either the landed class, the money class, whatever label you want to give them. Um, but yes, they are they are secretive uh, to anyone outside of that class. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of mystery surrounding uh, this class of people who always seem to have each other's backs, but maybe no one else's. Yes, <laughs> and, yes. um, you know, and um, in that way, your novel is quite cheeky, salacious, um, you know, very engaging. And so is Ruby R, because it uh, lifts the lid on a, a new political elite, right? Um, which kind of interacts with that uh, social class now. Um, and and yeah, I, I, I do want to kind of, get a little insight from you into, um, you know, how you come to these insights and what do you observe in your everyday life or where do you, which, where do you move in your everyday life that these, you know, little uh, nuggets come to you, these uh, characters, these, you know, salacious little bits of people's lives and give us some insight into and in how that comes about. So, I'm not actually that's very sweet of you to say all of that I don't know how it comes you know it's just, <laughs> it's just a half of, but I the one thing that I've always been interested in in my work is power and mm. uh, not necessarily political power but actually all power is political power but not as in as in political parties necessarily um mm. you know politics with a capital P and then politics with a small p most of my work is about politics with a small p it is about who has power in society? Mm -hmm. um, you know, how do people who have power use it? Do you mm -hmm. get power by virtue of your class? Do you get power by virtue of your gender? Do you get power by virtue of your marriage? Do you get power by virtue of birth? Do you get power by virtue of your job? Um, and, and those who have power, how do they make sure that um, they get to keep the power and prevent other people from accessing it. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, the um, the Diary of a Social Butterfly is, um, I've always thought of it, and some people think it's chiclet, but for me, it's always, it always has been um, social commentary and continues mm -hmm. to be social commentary. It's about, um, in a way, because, you know, as you were saying that this is the financial elite, some, or the social elite, it's definitely people the, the privileged class in Pakistan mm. and my work I've always felt was speaking truth to power mm -hmm. so you know telling them inconvenient truths about themselves but in a in a funny way so that people can uh, can look at it and, and appreciate it and laugh at it and you know right. when they say that um, when somebody opens their mouth to laugh you also put a pill in at the same time you know so that's what satire is so yeah. um, that's what I try and do. Uh, Ruby R is also about power, mm -hmm. um, about, you know, uh, and Ru part of the reason why Ruby takes this job, um, which she was never intended to take, which she would um, had would have would have probably had laughed if somebody had said you were going to end up doing this, um, is because she too feels powerless, in mm -hmm. and she wants to associate herself. Uh, with power, with people who mm -hmm. have power, because she feels that she will be protected that way. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and, and and as for the humor and things, I think it's just, it's all around you, you know, I just feel like it's like osmosis, it just comes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you, once you start looking and once you start engaging, uh, you start noticing. And has anybody before, uh, so I want to go back to what you said about power and Ruby R, but just quickly before that, I'm just curious. Uh, in your books, uh, Tender Hoax, Butterfly, uh, Return of the Butterfly, has anybody ever come up to you and or tweeted at you or sent you an email saying, 
why did you write about me? Has anyone <laughs> thought yes, that? Yes, uh, yes. Really? Once, once somebody did, and I had to go and eat humble pie because uh, she was very upset. And I had used a name, you know, and it just, uh, I make up names, and it just happened to be her name as well. And so she, she oh. was very upset, and she said, you know, it's about me, and, and it wasn't about her. It was just, I just made it up. Um, but uh, actually, uh, Hamna, what is very surprising is that some people come up to me and they said, um, I was reading your work and I thought um, this is about people like me, like right. us, like us. You have shown, you've held up a mirror to us. Um, right. But other people also come up to me and say things like, who adopted it? I it's a made up character and, and there's a lot of myself in it as well. And I keep telling people, people don't believe me, but there is a lot of myself. The, the, the stuff that I filter out, you know, <laughs> that you yeah. have unworthy <laughs> thoughts that you have and then you think, oh, oh, I mustn't think like that. That's really unworthy of me. I must not. Those are the bits that I channel and I put straight onto the page. That's very interesting. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a, it's good of you to admit that, actually. <laughs> uh, very interesting. Um, but yeah, coming back to the point that you touched on earlier about um, power and who we are. And yes, definitely, I think that um, when I think about your latest book, Ruby R, it talks about power um, in a much more direct sense because it's directly dealing with this big political party and this man who wants to be in power and this group of people that he's putting together to be around him to help him get into that position. Whereas mm -hmm. in your uh, other novels, which I just mentioned before, we were talking about really um, like micro displays of power, you know, who's wearing the better outfit at a wedding, like, you know, or uh, something like that. But in Ruby R, it's different and the stakes are different. I'm not going to say that the stakes are higher or lower because that's maybe not the right comparison, but they're different. Mm -hmm. And when you were talking about how Ruby R, uh, Ruby Rolf wants to also find her own power, wants to establish herself as a person in her own right and finds that perhaps in the beginning of the novel, a way to do this is to ally herself with this party. Mm -hmm. um, that takes us into what we're talking about, which is women in Pakistan today, you know, women in Pakistan, emerging women, young women stepping into their own, stepping into power. And I, uh, before we talk more in depth about it, I did want some broad thoughts from you. Um, you've been observing, you know, through your novels and through your work as a journalist, uh, you know, women's movements and, and women in society for so long. Um, how do you think the state of feminism, women's movements, um, and young women today is right now in Pakistan. And how have things changed from when you were a young journalist yourself and when you were, you know, starting out with your career? Mm. Um, you know, Hamna, um, in Ruby R, uh, the book, um, there are two young women who are both working in journalism, in, in the media, so to speak. One is working in social media, one is working in, in, in more uh, traditional media. Um, and they're both friends. And um, when I was uh, working in journalism in Pakistan um, back in the 90s and then the early 2000s, um, I um, felt there were, there were very few of us, you know. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, they were influential because you know they, they were at Herald, they were at Newsline, they were at the News, um, but there wasn't there wasn't a critical mass of women. You know there were few voices. Um, they worked very hard. They 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 were um, they were quite uh, um, combative. Um, and of course, my sister Jubnu Mosin had set up the, the, the uh, she was the publisher of the Friday Times. So there were they were well, you know there, there was Sherry Rahman at Herald. Um, there were a lot of very interesting women at uh, uh, Newsline. Um, <clears throat> so um, since then, I've seen that more and more and more young women are in the media, and it makes me so happy to see that. And with the with the growth of satellite uh, television, with the growth of um, YouTube, etc., YouTube channels, um, and um, also on social media, I see so many young women, and I feel very happy when I see them because um, 
they are speaking uh, uh, again truth to power they are speaking they are they are sort of you know breaking the, the wall of patriarchy um and this brings me to a very interesting conversation i had um some years ago uh no but before i i, I talk about that conversation i want to say that sometimes i also feel that it's two steps forward one step back you know um you have as i said you, you see many more women in, in the uh, uh, civil service for example you see many more young women working in hospitals you mm -hmm. see you know, the entire sort of um uh, private education um initiative has been uh, powered by women you know all those yes. schools, like like uh, beacon house like yes. you know, school like city school there's a, there are women behind those yeah. and and they're very big schools now um yeah. i think beacon house is the largest school system in the world um but um so you feel that you know they they they're doing well and they're coming forward and then you used to see them at orat march but then immediately after that you see the the response to the orat march you see uh, a sexual harasser alleged sexual harass harasser being given the pride of performance by the president of pakistan right you see uh men coming on television and and abusing women uh you know on 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 uh, television and nobody uh, bats an eyelid about that so um you have these you know uh, and and recently that that the, that the charge of blasphemy against young women who participated and a trumped up charge you know a uh, 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 with those doctored slogans etc so sometimes i feel it's two steps forward one step back that there's much to be proud of there's much to be hopeful mm -hmm. for but at the same time there is this kind of undertow of 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 patriarchy and misogyny which yeah. comes back every now and again as well um so i was telling you about a conversation that i had many years not many about 3 4 years ago or 5 years ago i was at a uh, karachi literary festival and the great um uh writer urdu writer intizar hussain was there and he was a very old man at that time i think he was about 90 or so and um but you know sharp as a pin still and we were we were chatting and i said um you know that he migrated from what was then um india uh, from india to now what became pakistan and uh, he stayed on in the punjab and um we i was talking to him about what he, he thinks he you know the big transformations that have happened in pakistan since then because he was such an acute observer and he said to me that he had seen um to um uh constituencies uh um uh, gain prominence and power um uh, very rapidly in the last 20 to 30 30 30 to 40 years and i asked him i said who are which are those constituencies he says well one are mullahs and i said yeah well, i can understand that and he said and second are women mm -hmm. and, I said, and he said yeah um i see women are uh, uh, gaining in 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 um uh, prominence uh, becoming more active becoming more empowered becoming more uh, uh um articulate and vocal becoming more um visible um and i said well it seems to me that there's a contradiction in what you are saying because if the mullahs are coming mm -hmm. up, um they are doing their best to hold women back uh so how could that be he said well i think that is the dialectic pakistan is faced with um mm. and what happens to pakistan in the future will mm. be determined by who wins that fight because it will be a fight because both of them can't continue um together in the same way so uh one will will triumph over the other and and pakistan's future is is going to be determined by that struggle Yeah and it's interesting that you had that conversation at that time because I remember reading uh recently that uh Steve Bannon I think uh you know former advisor to President Trump had once mentioned in a conversation um and I, I you know don't endorse his views at all but this is just something I read that he had predicted that in America the greatest threat to Donald Trump would be uh from women you know the backlash the pushback would be the greatest from women and um and in a lot of ways we have seen that play out um I mean, and 
uh, yes, exactly, women and people of color. And um, in Pakistan, I mean, speaking as a young woman today, I would agree with you that, uh, you know, it's um, things are definitely reaching a boiling point uh, with conservative elements in society, which then interact with the state, which then gives a lot of pushback to women. Um, and I do think at this point, women are holding their own. We are holding our own. Uh, but like you said, it's a precarious situation. And I think that um, when it comes to power, if we circle back to our commentary on power, um, you know, young women are kind of, um, our, our options to, to be powerful are limited. And uh, like Ruby R, either we ally ourselves with uh, people who are powerful, but not perhaps ethical or, you know, not perhaps having integrity. Or then those alliances are made uh, through, and like I said, through professional means or then by marriage. Um, and apart from that, um, they don't seem to be a lot of options, which is, uh, which is tough right now. I, don't know. I, mean, I, would, I would disagree because I think, you know, power is not just political power, as I said. They, you know, like, for example, we were talking about the school system. Right. Um, the, the kind of, and, and it's the, 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 the schools are not just set up by the women. Uh, they're, most of them are staffed by women. Yes. You know, the number of teachers who are women far outnumber uh, male teachers. And so the kind of input that goes into young people, for instance, is is um, uh, given by women, right? So you will find that uh, the way that you know young women are, are interacting with students, they are teaching them, they are influencing them, they are changing their minds, they are changing their. So that that is also happening at the same time. So you know, um, power doesn't just necessarily come to you from from politics or from uh, who you marry. Um, for, for instance, if you are a, um, you work in, you pass the CSS exam, you become, uh, you join the police force, you become uh, an inspector, you become a district police of, uh, uh, officer, or, you know, with each step, your power grows. And there are many mm. young women now, for example, in the police force. There are women in the army, there are mm. women in bureaucracy, um, there are women in, um, um, uh, you know, in the medical profession. So they, they are getting more and more young women are getting educated. And as they leave villages and come into, you know, people move to towns and populations become more and more urban, uh, you are finding, I think, that, that there are more young women who are being educated and then therefore going out to do jobs and working. Mm -hmm. and once a woman starts making her own money, she also gets power. Yes. Yeah. And that's a different kind of power as well, but it's a very important power to be independent, yeah. to be financially independent, yeah. to, be able to make your own choices there. And um, speaking of power, I mean, uh, social media has, um, you know, having a presence on social media is a powerful tool for a lot of young women. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, it, having their voices heard and having their voices acknowledged, if not in Pakistan, then abroad, having access to that kind of voice. I think that's a very critical, important tool that has empowered and young women and given power to the feminist movement in Pakistan as well. Um, and I was wondering, uh, you, you were talking about this, and I was just wondering, I wanted your take on it. Do you think that, um, you know, men today are uh, afraid of this change of uh, this, you know, wave of women that is coming forward. Um, how how do you think, I don't know, in your conversations, in your daily life, how do you perceive the male reaction to to the emerging women in Pakistan? Oh, you know, uh, you only have to see their reaction to Aurat March. Mm -hmm. um, see well, how, how threatened they feel, how insecure they feel. Uh, and how frightened they are yeah. of women becoming empowered. Um, I will, I will add here that it's not all men. Mm -hmm. um, there are some men, a few men, um, are very supportive and uh, are, uh, want to to help women. In fact, in in this struggle, um, but I think by and large, most men are, feel very insecure. They feel threatened. They feel intimidated. Um, they feel that they uh, somehow or the other um, 
you know, and particularly when a woman says, Mera jisan, meri mercy, it seems to be like a, uh, oh, my body, my yeah. choice. It seems to be like a, a red rag to, to a bull. Um, that how dare a woman uh, uh, say that, that she has autonomy? Because that's what it comes down to. I mean, they can clothe it in anything that they like. They can say that it, it's vulgar. It shows that a woman wants to commit adultery or that mm. a woman is, is going to become sexually promiscuous if she says that. But what it's actually saying is that I have autonomy. Yeah. And that is something that they cannot bear because yeah. uh, it's also about controlling women's labor, you see. Yeah. At the end of the day, their reproductive power, their labor, yeah. um, their whatever they earn, you know, their, 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 um, uh, their earnings, their income, everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that is what is um, most frightening for them. Yeah. And... Um I feel like we should start maybe wrapping up and checking in and seeing if anyone has any questions for us. But uh, one last thing that I am interested to ask you, and I've seen that you're active on social media, like I said before, and you interact with ideas about you know women and feminism and politics, and you're tweeting, retweeting. Um, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on an established writer uh, you know, grappling with the issues of the day, not just in their work, but on a daily basis. And do you feel any sense of, um, you know, I mean, obviously you must feel a sense of responsibility, but if, if someone is not, if a writer or someone in your position is not active in that same way, or maybe publicly chooses not to engage with the issues of the day, and let's say they get backlash for it, what's your take on that? Like the public, profile of a writer or published author and their role? Um, you know, I believe that if you have some social capital, you mm -hmm. should, you know, you should speak. But um, uh, it's up everybody's choice, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you can't force people. And I think it's their right whether they want to speak or they don't want to speak. Um, I would always um, you know, from the time that I was a teenager, I was a teenager when, when WAF was formed. Mm -hmm. And I remember protesting on the streets of Lahore at that time. Um, and, you know, we were lat lati jar several times, etc. Um, and so I have continued. And so I would like to continue. But mm -hmm. obviously, it's everybody's choice. Uh, I also feel that, you know, you have to walk the talk. I mean, I want mm -hmm. to say those things and I also have to stand up for those things. Right. And it's interesting that you bring that up because we have a question actually from a viewer and uh, Maureen is asking whether uh, you think there have been any shifts in power dynamics from uh, your generation to the current uh, youth, the, the young generation right now. And you mentioned uh, the Women's Action Forum. So uh, what are your thoughts on that, on how uh they interact maybe with political power, with, with power in general? Yeah, I think I think there has been. Um, uh, a sh uh, somewhat of a shift, not enough, because, you know, we have a, a prime minister who is in his um, uh, late 60s, I think, um, but his challenger is in, uh, you know, in her late 40s, I think. Um, and, and so she is a, a young woman. Um, we also had a prime minister in Benazir Bhutto who was in her 30s at that time, if you remember. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I do believe that... Um, Younger women are more, I think, vocal now, mm -hmm. and I like that, and I welcome that. And uh, you know, this this Mera Jisam Meri Mazi calling out people for sexual harassment. These are new things, and I welcome mm -hmm. them. And I really uh, do admire young women who put themselves out for these things because I know how uh, painful the the, mm -hmm. the backlash is. And I, and I really admire their courage and their, their dedication and their spirit. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting because uh, when you talk about Mira and Jusumiri Marzi, um, you know, as a person living here in Pakistan and observing, and as a person who goes to Aurat March and is very involved every year, and, you know, um, when that slogan that you're talking about, Mira and Jusumiri Marzi, um, it was not only raised. Um, uh, objections from conservative elements in society, but also in my social circle with, uh, you know, 
you know, friends' mothers and, you know, grandparents, uh, women, they were uncomfortable with this. Even young as well. women. Even yes. young women, yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, it, they kind of felt like it was um, too um, obvious, too crass, and, um, you know, a lot of internalized misogyny playing out there. Um, and so it's not, it's, you know, that power dynamic is not so simple even. It's, it, it's overlaps, it crosses generations, it's, uh, it's a tricky thing to navigate. And a lot of young women were in the position of explaining to their mothers that, no, actually, this is not something vulgar. This is a basic right. This is about bodily autonomy. So even that is interesting. Mm -hmm. It is. But, you know, Hamna, we all know uh, that, you know, this internalized misogyny that we talk about, the patriarchy works in this way, right? That it, 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 it seizes control of your brain. And, and, and it, it, it becomes almost the oxygen that you breathe. Um, exactly. I think there's this, uh, um, you know, um, I forget his name now, um, the cross-dressing British um, artist, um, you know, the one who does, makes um, mm -hmm. author as well. Um, he dresses as a woman. Anyway, I've forgot, uh, forgotten his name now, it'll come to me. He said, uh, asking, um, asking women or asking anybody about uh, patriarchy and, and the effect it has on you is like asking fish their opinion on water. You know, this, <laughs> is, this is the element in which we live. This is how we, um, this is how uh, we, this is what we, this is what we swim in. This is what we be, this yeah. is all we know, you know? Yeah. So for older women, certainly it's very difficult to, to, yeah. um, cleanse their mind of it and try and think yes. differently. Yes. And we have another question real quick, if I can ask you. Uh, Kalpna asks, um, Moni, have you experienced this behavior yourself? Uh, and how have you handled it? What misogyny? Every yes. day. <laughs> <laughs> Every day in some form or another, you, you experience it. Either man will a mansplain to you or he will um, patronize you or uh, they will tell you that um, they um, or, or they will just tell you that you know you are you're wrong or you're stupid or you're this or you're that um, and when I was a younger woman and I was working in in, in um, um, the newspapers and in and, and, um, journalism in Pakistan the kind of you know they'll make passes at you they will you know it's just harassment you know every day and has has any man ever uh offered you advice like writing advice because that's that's something that is priceless <laughs> when that happens <laughs> yes they, uh, and also they would tell me um how i should not write i mean i've constantly been told oh that, God. Uh, you know various things like that yeah yeah okay well i think we need to start wrapping up our conversation uh moni and um i'm wondering if ambika or anyone wants to pop back into the conversation so we can you know uh offer them a thank you for having us here uh, i had a lovely time talking to you um i would say that in closing uh, was there anything else you'd like to say about your latest book because it is out right now uh, it's you know been published in pakistan in, I think. yeah it's coming out in pakistan next month inshallah um yeah. well, probably actually may uh, not april but may um and um do read it please read it with an open mind uh don't think that this is so and so and this is so and so and that's so and so because at the end of the day everything that a writer writes comes actually from their imagination you can be inspired by certain things, but you write from your imagination and you channel a whole lot of different things and thoughts that go through your mind. Um, but I just wanted to say also, thank you so much, Hamna, for, for mm -hmm. this wonderful interview, for your time. Thank you everybody who watched. Um, I'm very grateful and um, I hope you have enjoyed it as much as I have. And I also have Arts Forum as well for inviting me. Thank yes. you. Thank you. And just, oh, here we go with Ambika. Hi, Ambika. <laughs> Hi. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. You were saying something. I don't want to. Um... 
No, no, I was just, uh, we had one last question, Moni, if you can just give your, share your thoughts on this. Sure. Um, and the last question was uh, by Ira. Um, do you think conservative elements in Pakistan are gaining. becoming stronger, like gaining a greater foothold at this present moment? Uh, you know, it's difficult to say, but uh, I, in my view, all populist governments um, are patriarchal governments, they're right-wing patriarchal governments. You see that in India with Modi, you've seen that in, with Trump mm -hmm. in America, you've seen that with um, also with Boris Johnson in, in, in um, the UK, you see it in Pakistan with Imran Khan. Um, so um, are they gaining strength? Well, uh, they did win this wave of elections uh, in, in 20, from 2016 onwards. Um, Modi won, I think, his first one in 2014. Um, and yes, sometimes I find it very, very depressing and I, and I worry about it. But at the same time, as Intazar Hussain said, women are also stepping up. Um, so every, with, for every action, there's also been a reaction. So when Trump said yeah. did this, there was a reaction from women. Uh, there was a reaction from people of color. And, and my God, last year, Black Lives Matter became one of the most important movements to sweep the, the, the globe last year. And, and also, um, you know, uh, when we have more and more mullahs and, and right wing uh, uh, views in Pakistan, we also have Aurat March at the same time. And we have young women like yourself, Hamna, um, who mm -hmm. are beacons of hope and optimism for us. Oh, that's very kind of you, Moni. <laughs> um, and thank you so much for this chat, Moni. Thank you so much. And thank you also to Art Forum. I just want to quickly mention uh, for anyone who uh, you know joined late that Art Forum is uh, a not-for-profit that strives to define and promote all art forms emerging from South Asia. Um, and they endeavor, endeavor to present the visual, literary, and the performing arts in their various versions um, to enable um, a platform for South Asian voices. And um, if Ambika, you want to add to that, please, please jump in. Um, um, Absolutely. Thank you so much, Hamna. Thank you so much, Moni, for coming and being part of Art Forum's uh, platform. And we got to talk about a really interesting topic. And uh, we all are very thankful for that. It's been enlightening. It's been uh, very entertaining <laughs> and mm -hmm. true, true, very, uh, you know, insightful and uh, points. So thank you for being part of this. And, from the bottom of our heart, the whole Art Forum team. Uh, and Sala, thanks you for this. Thank you so um, much for having us. Absolutely. Take care. But friends, before you go, do not, um, uh, uh, just wanted to let you know about our uh, next session. It is uh, by Salima Hashmi. She's a renowned contemporary artist from Pakistan. So please do like and share and subscribe to our YouTube channels. Um, and of course, we cannot let you go before uh, telling you to please donate. This is a free public program that we are offering. And if you like what you've seen so far, please donate. Uh, go to www.artforumsf.org slash donate. And last but not the least, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Art Forum Board of Directors, our executive team and the media and everybody who's helped us put this event together. A big thank you for spending an hour with us today and until next time, goodbye.